of you got stuck in the storm this week? Anybody? You were out in it? Who was out in it? How was it? Scary. Where were you? Driving or? Wow. Dodging tree limbs, things like that. Anybody else out in it? Pretty bad, wasn't it? How many of you saw what happened on 140 in Westminster with the uh, poles coming down? I had just left the hospice in Westminster where uh, Keith Sutton was with his mom. I had to push all the patients into the hall because of the windows and the trees around the hospice center. When I was there, I went out and I turned on Malcolm Drive east on 140 and I looked behind me, it looked like night. I got home just as the wind hit and the water started to fall. My dog had to go out, but she looked out the door and said, uh-uh, crossed her legs and went in the bathroom, shut herself in. She does that all the time. I don't know why. She gets in there and realizes I have no opposable thumb. I can't open the door. Barks to come out, but I went in with her. Really bad storm, wasn't it? I looked out my back window. You couldn't see anything but branches coming toward the window, and I didn't know if the tree was down or what. Imagine that in the first century at night on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, like Genesaret. Now, there are naysayers, people who say nay about everything. They say, ah, Jesus was walking along the shore on the rocks, and they thought he was on the water. Now, they were about four miles out. So this is one of those stories that appears in three out of four Gospels, Jesus walking on water. Only in this one does Peter walk to Jesus on the water, at least tries to. And then he finds out that his name is Peter for a reason. He Walks on water just like a rock, right, right to the bottom. But the boats in those days were very shallow bottom boats. And storms came up very quickly on the Sea of Galilee, and it came up very quickly, and they thought they were going to die. These are people who worked on the water. This had to be a particularly bad storm. And then suddenly Jesus, who was up on the hill praying, comes walking to them. Now maybe you're thinking, didn't she just preach on this a couple weeks back? Wasn't it? it was more than a couple weeks ago. It was back when the choir was getting ready to take their summer hiatus and we did their favorites. And somebody wanted to sing, You lift me up so I can stand on mountains. You lift me up to walk on stormy seas. And that's the passage I picked. Teresa, was that your song that you had picked? That was your favorite? Now, I thought when Lambert was going to Ireland, and I hope they don't mistake him for a leprechaun and try to keep him while he's over there, they were glad to have you here, Grace. Lambert said, you got to give me the, the music for the lessons early, so I had to pick the songs really early. I looked at the lectionary, and of course, this came up. I thought, great, we just did that. But I didn't have time to come up with something else, so I did this one. But I read a commentary, and it opened my eyes to something new about looking not at the story from Peter's perspective, looking at it from Jesus' perspective. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Now, um, you're going to learn a little Greek this morning. Ego ami. Say, ego ami. Ego, like let go my ego. Ego ami. Ego ami. You know what it means? It means I am. I am. Which is really the translation of what happens in the boat when Jesus walks to them on the water. But let's go back to the beginning of the story. But remember, ego ami. You're going to be saying that, I hope, all day to yourself. I hope you say it the rest of your life to yourself. Ego ami. We'll talk about what it means in just a moment. But... Um, Jesus, it says, immediately he sent them away on the boat. After what? He was tired. He wanted to go off by himself up the mountain to pray. What had he just done? This is one that appears in all four Gospels. The only miracle that appears in all four Gospels is what? The feeding of the multitudes. He has just fed all these people in the presence of his disciples. And this is Matthew's Gospel, so he includes them in the feeding. They're part of the miracle. And they get in the boat, and immediately they're scared when the storm comes up. But Jesus is up there praying by himself, and he has to get to them. How could he have gotten to them? What are some other possibilities for Jesus getting to that boat out in the middle of this lake? What could he have done? No coast guard, no... He could have tried swimming four miles out in a storm. He could have done it, you know. Maybe like, like in the cartoons. Maybe that wouldn't have scared him so much, but... Um, that's one thing. What else could he have done? Hmm? Could have gotten a boat for somebody else. Because can you imagine renting a boat at that time during a storm like we had the other day? Saying to somebody, I want you to take your boat out. And they'd say, right, right, right. Or he could have taken a boat. He could have stolen a boat. He could have built a boat probably just, you know, 
Have you done it? I dream a genie, boink, and there'd be a boat. Because he could do that, because he's Jesus, right? But he takes the most direct route. He walks to them. They have just seen him feed 5,000 people, meaning men, meaning 10,000 altogether, men, women, children. They've seen that happen from this kid's lunch. And still they go, ah, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. We don't get to see which disciple said that, because that would have been the shame of all time, wouldn't it, forever? Bartholomew saith unto him, it is a ghost. No, it's, we, one of them says it's a ghost. And Jesus rolls his eyes or something like that, we would see. But instead, Peter says to him what? If it is you, come here. But before they say that, it's take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. I always say whenever an angel or Jesus says to you, don't be afraid, be afraid, because something weird is about to happen. Let's be honest, right? You don't say, don't be afraid when things are going well, do you? You're having your birthday party and you're having cake and a little champagne and somebody says, don't be afraid. You're like, why would I be afraid? You say, don't be afraid when someone's about to hit the fan, right? When you say, don't be afraid, and they say, don't, Jesus says, take courage. That means don't be afraid. And then he says, do not be afraid. It is I. It is I is the wrong translation. It is I should be translated ego ami. Say that again, ego a me. means I am, I am, I am. Where have we heard that line before, I am? Hmm. Hmm. The burning bush, Jackie says. The burning bush. Moses is out there in the middle of the desert, and this bush is burning, but it doesn't seem to burn up. It just seems to be flaming. And he walks closer, and the voice comes from the bush. And who's the voice? God speaks to him and says, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. So he takes off his shoes and he sees this burning bush and the bush says, this is what I need you to do. You need to go to Pharaoh because I've seen my people suffering and I've come down to deliver them. This is what you're going to do. I'm here to deliver them through you. This is what you're going to do. And Moses is like, ah, no, I don't think so. If I go back to Egypt, they'll kill me because I killed that Egyptian soldier. And also he says, I don't talk really well and I know what that feels like now. So he says, take your brother, he can speak for you. And then Moses is like out of excuses. And he says, who should I say send me? And what did God say? I am. Ego a me, I am, I am, I am. We've talked about epiphany before. What's an epiphany? That aha, I should have had a V8 moment. You know, that blink. I should have seen this coming. I should have known this. Aha, everything is revealed to you. This is an epiphany. This is what's called a theophany. Theo meaning God, God revealed. It's the moment when God is revealed, just like in that burning bush. That's the theophany, God speaking from a bush. Here's a theophany. Jesus is walking to them on water, something nobody does, right? Have you ever seen anybody walk on water for real? No, and you're not going to see it probably unless Jesus comes to you that way at some point in your life. But we don't walk on water. I swim like Peter walks on water like a rock. I go right to the bottom. My mother said, as long as you don't learn to swim, you'll never be near the water so you can't drown. That's crazy, but that was my mom. Love you, Hattie. Anyway, they think it's a ghost. And he says, it is I. Nope, he says, I am, I am, I am. This goes back to the Old Testament in so many ways. The book of Job. How many of you have ever read the book of Job? Not a happy story, is it? What happens to Job? What doesn't happen to Job? Job is a prosperous man, very prosperous for his time. And the Satan, not Satan, the Satan, the, the Satan, meaning the adversary, meaning the prosecuting attorney, says to God the judge, well, of course he's faithful, because God says, look at my boy Job, he's so good. I wish everybody could be like Job. And he says, well, yeah, Job's got nothing to complain about. Job's got everything going his way. Just like nobody says, don't be afraid if you're at your birthday party having cake and champagne. He was having cake and champagne his whole life. And the Satan says to God, let me have him for a while. Let's see how faithful he's going to be. And then everything, the bottom falls out of his life. He loses his land and his crops and his herds. And then his children are killed. Then he's sitting in the ash heap. Imagine sitting in the ash heap with boils all over your body. You've got a rock and you're scraping the slua. Nasty, nasty stuff. His wife says, just curse God and die. Get it over with, buddy. And his friends come to see him, and they're really great pals, aren't they? They say, 
Surely you did something to bring this all on yourself because God is righteous and just. I hope you don't have friends like that who kick you when you're down. And Job just wants one question God to answer. What's the question he wants to ask God? Why me? What did I do to deserve this? And he finally gets this moment with God, and what does God say to him? God says, well, Job, you see, Satan was trying to prove a point, and I wanted to show him, no, 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 no. God says, where were you when I created the universe? Mm-mm. Where were you when I walked on the face of the water? That's what it says. Then in the Septuagint, which is that old, the first translation of the Hebrew Scriptures into Greek, which happened like 3rd, 4th century, that's where we see the words I am, the ego I me again. And we also see Job saying, when I walked on the sea, when I walked on the sea, theophany, ha, 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 ha. This isn't just Jesus coming to them. This is God in human form coming to them in their need. But old Peter, we could just say, how many times have I preached this way? Peter was the rock. Peter doubted God saved him so God could save us. Even when we doubt, amen, let's go have some cake downstairs. This is a different passage when you read it from the perspective of this is who Jesus is for us. This is God coming to us in the storm, walking on the water to get to us. Nothing's going to stop God from getting to you. No matter what happens in your life, God's going to get there. And Peter sings... This is where I always say in the sermon, Jesus, if it's a good thing I'm not Jesus, because I said, that serves you right, buddy. You should have trusted me, uh-huh, uh-huh. No, he reaches out his hand and pulls him in. Now, Toby reads so very beautifully. I'm so glad you were the liturgist this morning, because one thing that I read in a commentary this week, is we don't know the tone that Jesus said to Peter, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? What's one way you could say that with one what meaning is conveyed in the tone that you use with that? Somebody say it in one way. Toby, say what you said again. Can you stand up nice and loud and say, um, Oh, you have a little faith, why did you doubt? Sort of like, oh, come on, guys, you know this. Or Jesus could said, you little faith, why did you doubt? We don't know what his tone was, do we? Or you have a little faith, why did you doubt? We don't know what the tone is, but we know that Jesus is asking him the question that he can't answer. But he gets in the boat and the wind ceases and they worship him, saying, truly you are the Son of God, which they should have known by then, right? They just saw him feed all those people. They still don't get it, though, do they? We've got to look at this in the context of what happened before even that story. We talk about you have little faith, because right before Jesus feeds the crowd, he's in a boat teaching another crowd but then follows him and wants dinner later. So what does he teach him? If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, that's all you need. So Jesus knows what can happen with a little faith, right? A little faith can move a mountain. A little faith can take that tree and plant it over here. A little faith can do all kinds of things. So he's not really chastising him. He's saying, use the faith you have. Use that little bit of faith you have. I don't know any pastor who's been in the ministry as long as I have who has never baptized a baby who has died. I did that one time. Doctrinally, are we supposed to baptize people who already died? What would you think to that, doctrinally? According to the written theology of the United Methodist Church or any Christian denomination, do we baptize dead people? You all don't know? The answer is no, you don't. Because they don't need to be baptized. Because we believe that any child who dies is with Christ, whether they're baptized or not baptized, is what saves us. Jesus Christ saves us. And I was with a woman named Heather who just died herself a couple months ago in her 50s. She had such bad health her whole life. She and her husband were members of my congregation. She had lost four children along the way through miscarriage. Finally, they decide on in vitro fertilization. She was on her last implanted embryos. And she was in her eighth month and thought everything was fine. Went to the doctor by herself, and the doctor said, I'm sorry, there's no heartbeat. And because of where we lived, she had to carry her baby to term. I went in the day that they were going to induce her labor, and I said to her, do you want me to stay with you? And she said, 
you don't have to. That's too much to ask. I said, that wasn't my question. My question is, do you need me to stay with you? And she said, that's too much to ask. I said, no. The question is, do you need me to stay with you? She said, please don't leave me. And I stayed with her. And I watched the agony they went through. Now, there's a sound that people make when their child dies. It's a wail that I have heard too many times in my life, in my ministry. Now, a few years later, I was at the Board of Ordinary Ministry interviewing candidates, and the candidate who was a young person who is now a superintendent, this was many years ago, was asked the question, would you baptize a child who had died? And that's not a question we should ask. And I was like, stop with the question. But she said, no, I would, not, I would not do that. I would sit down and teach them. It's not a teachable moment if your child has just been born still born. But it is a moment for grace. And she looks at me and said, would you baptize my daughter? Please baptize my daughter. That's a little bit of faith. It's a little bit of faith. And in any faith she had at that moment, I was going to nurture. It didn't matter if I broke any rule or not. But my sacramental theology professor, Dr. Stuckey, who is also with Jesus full-time now, said, use the grace to go with Jesus in this moment. You have that opportunity, and I thought then I hope I never have that opportunity, but every pastor I know has had that at some point if you're in the ministry long enough where somebody says, will you baptize my child who has died? It's a little bit of faith. We're called to nurture the faith in each other. We are called not just to notice that God is with us in Jesus Christ, but to do what he said, because remember, Jesus will go on to say the night before he dies, you will do what I do in greater things than these, which means we've got to get out of the boat sometimes, not because we're Peter, but because we're letting Jesus move us and use us in our lives. We've got to walk to people who are in need, no matter what. It reminds me of Austin Cummings, who is one of the greatest characters I will ever have the honor or crazy time of serving as pastor. Austin was a nut. Every Sunday, his wife on the, to the door would say, I'm sorry for everything he said to you this week and everything he's going to say to you next week, because he was a crazy man. Austin's one. I've told you the story about when I announced that I was getting married. He said at the back door that day, he hugged me. He said, congratulations on your upcoming wedding. We ought all just going to use the fact that you're a lesbian. I said, what? He said, well, you were a lesbian, right? Because I was 42 and never been married. You know what that means, right? Aw. I said, no, dear, I'm not a lesbian. He said, but you were and you converted, right? I said, it's not like being a Jew or a Presbyterian, Austin. His wife just stood there going, oh, my, oh, my. Somebody just... Just make him stop talking. I love this man so much. He was a crazy man. There was a day that I got some really bad news, and I was so upset in my own home. It was a big storm in my life, huge storm. And there was a knock on the door, and it was Austin. I thought, oh, no, what am I doing? I said, Austin, you can't come in. I'm having a really bad day. And he said, I know. That's why I'm here. I know that's why I'm here. Theophany, that's God walking to you on the water. We've got to do that for each other, folks. We've got to do that for each other. We've got to do that for each other. What's the word again? Ego on me? Ego on me? Let me hear you say it. Ego on me. I am. That is who God is. God is. God is. God will always be. God will come to us in our need. There are other kinds of storms, aren't there? They're not just the storm that we had last week, although there are people who need help cleaning up their yards, cleaning up their mess. But we have other sorts of messes, don't we? Other sorts of storms. What are other storms that hitch in life? Maybe not literal, but those other kinds. Grief, big storm. Illness, huge storm. Depression, way huge storm. We got to start walking to other people and say, Ego on me, I am. I'm here representing Jesus Christ. I'm here representing God because Jesus Christ is God. And although our unwillingness to see that sometimes can obscure who Christ really is, nothing, even our biggest doubts, our worst moments, our biggest failures will ever obscure God seeing us and knowing where we are and coming to us in our need. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the Apostle Paul much later than this. That is who God is for us. We're going to sing another oldie today. Do you all like all these old hymns? I know some of you are just so happy old hymns. Some of you are like, oh, what's your name old hymns for? Oh. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. Do you know what a pilot does on a ship? It's not like the airplane pilot. It's not like this is not an aircraft carrier 
with the pilots going in and out. A pilot is someone who comes onto a ship when it's in the harbor. A pilot takes the, over the ship. It's not the captain. The captain steps aside and lets the pilot come on board because the pilot knows where all the rocks are, where all the things are that can hurt the ship. And the pilot's one of the guides that into the shore. Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. Unknown ways before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous shoal. Chart and compass came from thee. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. As a mother stills her child, you can hush the ocean wild. Boisterous waves obey thy will when, the, when you say to them, be still. Wonder, sovereign of the sea, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. When at last I near the shore, this is the big shore, the big shore, the big shore that is to come. And the fearful break of words between me and the peaceful rest, then while leaning on thy breast, may I hear thee say to me, fear not, I will pilot thee. I am, I am, I am. It's who Jesus is for us, God. This is theophany, folks. This is not just about our doubt. Jesus pulling us in. This is about the God who will come to you no matter where you are, no matter how bad things seem, no matter how desperate you are, no matter how depressed you are, no matter how despairing you are, no matter if you think you can't even get out of bed again, Christ will come to you where you are and lead you out because this is who he is. He is God in human form. Born a human so he knows what it is to be afraid, what he knows what Peter was feeling, what he knows what it is. He went to them because he knew how scared they were because they're people. But he came to them because he's God. And that is good news. Amen, amen, amen. Would you